James, Raf, free my boy. Oh yeah, free him, free him. FTX, in some ways, like that was an important part of down round canon, was it not? To introspect for a minute. Yeah, I think it's honestly more important for us than it was for the crypto industry or mm -hmm. uh, Sam Bankman Freed. Mm. It was a formative moment for me and you. Yes. And then the rest of the stuff is not that important. Indeed. Early down round. It was not one year ago. I believe we did an episode about FTX, which... About one year ago, precisely, yeah. Yeah, and um, really kicked things into gear. Yep. Everything we said was facts. Facts only. Facts only. And has been vindicated. Vindicated. The analysis was as huge as always. Extraordinary. Yeah. And people realized... These boys are cooking. These yeah. white boys are cooking. <laughs> These crazy ass white boys know a thing or two, eh? You heard so, it there first. With that in mind, I'm incredibly glad to see Sam Backman Free going to jail for the rest of his life. <laughs> FTX, Sam Bankman Freed. Yep. Well, well, very quickly, to those living under a rock, FTX was a cryptocurrency exchange. Was the it biggest not? in the world. Notable. Or second biggest. Second biggest after Binance. But like Binance obviously had like a massive presence in Asia, et cetera. But yep. realistically, FTX was the most high profile, especially yep. in the United States of America, as well as Australia, primarily due to, well, two factors. One, spending big on marketing, going big. Huge. FTX Stadium in Florida in yep. Miami, um, but number two, the charismatic leader, Sam Bankman Fried. Yep. Fried is like, that's the gag. So they get, that, they maybe get, I won't do They get so the that. gag that he's going to the electric chair. Bankman, they bring about the electric chair just for SPF. <laughs> Sam Bankman no longer freed. No, yeah, I like that one. Okay, sure. He won over everyone with his swag. Pure swag. I wouldn't call him charismatic, but he had a certain je ne sais quoi. Well, <laughs> I mean, I don't know what charisma is, but because the point being, like, everyone thought this bloke was a friggin' genius. Yeah. With Big, the messy hair, T-shirts and shorts, which actually were mentioned in the trial, which we'll get into yep. in a minute. The boy genius. Yep. SBF on stage with Bill Clinton and Bill Gates. Yep. I always, look, I always found him a, a questionable character, but he cert mm. certainly other people, lower IQ than myself, mm. found that sort of thing appealing rapturous love-ins in the media on this Yeah, point. this is the guy that's taking crypto legit, right? This yeah, is exactly. the guy, you know, it's 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 sort of a den of scams and iniquity and whatever, but this guy is going to bring it together with the, the traditional financial system yeah. that people love so much. Five minutes in the room with this guy, any hater will turn into a believer. Yeah, and not only that, he's not just making crypto legit, but he is fixing the world. He's yeah. taking the revenue from this crypto scheme. Mm. He's, a, he's an effective altruist, which we talked about a few times on the podcast before. He's fixing the world. He's investing in stuff that matters. Yeah, he has pledged to give 100% of his inheritance to charitable causes. Yep, he's a democratic donor. He's not like those crazy right-wing crypto guys. No. He helps sleepy Joe Biden win. Yep, yep, all uh, that. Look, for many of you, we're simply relitigating stuff that you already know. And the main thing that's happened, the main story is that uh, last week, end of last week, Sam Bankman fried was found guilty. Yes. Of uh, eight various counts of securities fraud of, and of wire fraud, fraud yes. and et cetera. Yeah, and it took, the, it took the jury, I think, just slightly longer than it takes them to eat their complimentary pizza from the um, uh, district office of New York, the, the New York court system. Uh, it was a very open and shut case. It was a very open and shut case. You're not you're not looking at a huge, a hugely rigorous defence here. There wasn't a whole lot to defend. He has been found guilty. Hasn't been sentenced as yet. We're waiting for sentencing, but the maximum is something like two hundred years, yeah, a, a trillion years in a crystal prism or something like that. <laughs> yeah. You know, I don't want to dive into it. But yeah, let, let, we'll we'll talk a bit about it. So. Before we get into trial, um, I'm sure there's a lot of you that listened to our FTX episode at the time or probably listened to other stuff and figured out what went down. But, Raf, give us the like basic thing that SBF and FTX did. In layman's terms, they lost a lot of money, fraudulently. <laughs> but uh, I guess primarily there's two parties we need to think about. 
Alameda, which is an investment hedge fund that he started, and FTX. And basically, Alameda lost shitloads of money, and that money they were taking from FTX customer funds. So you deposit money into FTX. Uh, turns out Alameda speculated with that money in the crypto markets and lost it all. Yeah, which, uh, you know, for those playing along at home, in regular banking, forget the crypto stuff, huge no-no. You can't be doing that. Mm. Can't be wildly betting customer money. Got to keep, there's, there's a wall between those things. And there was a bunch of other like weird little mechanisms that made this work. They had their own little token, which was didn't have any real value, but had some ascribed value to yeah. it. Lots of people were buying it. Well, lots of people were buying it, but they also own 98% of like all of it. And so they were able to kind of control how much their token was worth and use that to borrow, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, but the short story is that FTX was using customer deposits mm. because even though this was a crypto exchange, it kind of functioned like a bank because mm. a bunch of customer money was sitting on it. They were using that to invest in all sorts of things. A, they were buying their own coin, like they were buying coins. Yeah. They were investing like in doing like venture capital investments in crypto companies. Yeah. Spending wildly on marketing. Spending obviously. wildly, exactly what we were just talking about, political donations, spending it on like sponsorships for stadiums. Yeah. And then just via Alameda, just speculating wildly yeah. on various concepts. And I guess it's worth pointing out here that SBF and Caroline Ellison, who was his on again, off again partner, but also the CEO of Alameda, the, yep. in, the investment arm. They were both from Jane Street, which was a very highly regarded trading firm that gets all these, you know, eccentric geniuses. Eccentric math geniuses and, and, to, and to come up with like novel and interesting and highly complex idea like ways to invest money and speculate and make money. And they both came out of that. So they were again wildly seen as these kind of geniuses that have this arcane knowledge on how to you know, use math to arbitrage between various things, and they were doing this on the stock market. No, it turns out Alameda lost something like $13 billion. Absurd amount of money. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the trial and the reason we kind of want to do the episode, apart from taking stock of the fact that we, we covered this a year ago and now it, the situation is at least somewhat resolved and in that, that like a guilty verdict has been found, but a lot of like the mechanisms of how this stuff was happening mm. is really interesting and really funny. Yeah, well, I mean, the craziest thing as an overall statement is how SBF was seen as this legitimizer. FTX was seen as the safe one. And it's so hard to remember now, like this was, they were talking to, you know, the CFTC about doing futures and actually like all futures contracts maybe moved to like this FTX in order to, like, so like elements of the stock market, they would run. You know, it was seen as like this legitimate. That was the idea. That was the goal. He had aspirations to be the, the president, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Like it was seen as fully legitimate. And then as this, well, A, as the early leaks, and then B, as this trial has basically shown, like this was more of a shambles than a small subcontracting uh, labor business. Yeah, this, like, this is like bricklayer, and I, I'm picking bricklayer at random. There's a lot of fine bricklaying <laughs> companies who I'm sure they're using zero. They're importing their costs and output, the hairdressers. Like we're talking like this level of accounting. But I'm, I think it's fair to say there are a few bricklayers working in Sydney whose books are not entirely above board. <laughs> yeah, is that is that fair to say? I hope that's a fair <laughs> statement. And there are also plenty of bricklayers whose books are probably in far better shape. Oh, and they're accounting pristine <laughs> compared and to SPF. Yeah, and their accounting practices are far more rigorous. Well, than yeah, this is, so um, the the interim CEO of this is before the trial went on. The interim CEO they appointed to FTX to essentially like untangle all this shit and be like, how much money can we get back to investors and depositors? What can we kind of do? This is the guy that he was one of the guys that did the exact same thing with Enron when mm. it collapsed, which was at one point obviously the biggest corporate collapse in US history. And he basically walked out after what I assume was the, the worst week anyone's ever had mm. on the job. <laughs> it's got to be up there. To, to basically say it is insane to me how this company was run. Yeah. The complete dereliction of duty in the way that stuff was organized, no controls, no like delineation between different accounts. Mm. All the money was sort of sloshing around in a big old pile, mm. and they had no way of knowing where anything was at any time. That was sort of the way he established it. And then throughout this trial, because to be clear, the two founders, two other big players in the FTX universe, aside from Sam Bankman Fried, namely Caroline Ellison and his co founder, 
Nishad Singh, have basically come out and just validated the fact that this was a complete shambolic enterprise from the yeah. ground up. Which is, again, so funny to compare to this guy was getting front page you know, newspaper profiles yeah, and magazine Time profiles. Magazine and- he was like, this is the guy. Everyone's talking about crypto and NFTs. A, this is going to be the way the old world is organized, mm. you know, TBC. <laughs> and B, this is the guy that's going to make it happen. Yeah. He was like the, ma- the mainstream media's darling and this stuff. And the fact that he was running a company that, as you suggested, less well run than like the burger shop on the corner of your street <laughs> yeah. is very funny. Yeah. So play the highlights of the trial. Sam's defense, I guess we should say first, is that he was running things fine. A bunch of stuff happens that he wasn't across, but he wasn't aware basically of the amount of yep. money that Alameda, that Caroline Ellison's business, the you know, investment company that he obviously the, co-founded. The, the defense pitched SBF as here's a, like a smart, a little bit naive guy who just wanted to do something great. Mm. And people took advantage of him, uh, and maybe he bit off more than they could chew. Yeah, maybe yeah, that's yeah. Hap- maybe that's happened. Yeah, in his quest to, for growth and you know to be the greatest, maybe at times like he was a little fast and loose by trying to achieve that goal. Yeah, but never illegally. No, he he never intended to defraud anyone or steal any money or do anything. Yeah, yeah, and also he wasn't aware that Caroline Ellison was losing all this money. Yeah, it's kind of like one of the claims that Alameda, which had an account. With FTX, you know, they were able to borrow money from FTX, kind to, of. To be clear, uh, as uh, just to, to hammer it home, Alameda and FTX, even though they were both started by Sam and were kind of like interlinked in very obvious ways, were supposed to be and they were sold as being completely separate. Yeah, yeah. So they didn't interface in, in, any, sort of, in any sort of way. So he was trying to say that like Caroline basically lost all this money from Alameda and then all the FTX failings. Well, that was just like, yeah, sure, their accounting like wasn't great. They made some mistakes there and unfortunately let Alameda... Ultra scale business, it growing pains. Yeah, growing pains. And and but Alameda failing, he had no real idea until it was way too big to kind of um get on top of it. Obviously Caroline testified that that was not the case, that he knew about Alameda's woes. The interesting thing being, and we discussed this well, we speculated on it back then, and it still isn't fully clear, but Alameda was losing so much money even before crypto markets crashed. Yeah, because, again, the, the the straw that broke the camel's back was the crypto market collapsed. So yeah. the value of a lot of these tokens plummeted. The assets on the FTX books didn't started looking pretty bad, Yeah, yeah. which sort of really kicked the tires of the whole organization. That's yeah, yeah. how the whole thing fell to pieces. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, but Alameda but that, losing thirteen billion dollars was a huge hole in the FTX books because that thirteen billion dollars, it turns out, was mostly customer money. Yes, Caroline had a few good nuggets about SPF though, including that you know he saw himself as one day running for president. Yeah, which I mean he still could. Oh, it's, yeah. I don't know if you're allowed to hold office as a felon. You're not allowed to vote, but I think you may be allowed to. Maybe there's a loophole. I don't know. You get. I think you can because I'm pretty sure Trump. Can. He can, yeah, yeah. yeah he's yeah. just not allowed to vote. So he's all, he's all good. So one of the interesting tidbits was about the spreadsheet, the balance sheet. Yeah. So this was this was very funny because um, one thing that you may recall from initially in the story, when the FTX stuff started to fall apart, a balance sheet, quote unquote, was like circulated amongst the media, mm. which had been put together by SBF, mm. basically establishing with kind of what they looked like as a business at that time. This was when everything was falling to pieces. And the general response was like, well, this is not really a balance sheet. No. This is like the world's worst formatted Excel spreadsheet that you've clearly put together in 20 minutes. Yeah, exactly. It included like a little a cell and column that was like, that had $8 billion in it mm. that was apparently describing like a bank account that had been poorly labeled and people had forgotten about, yeah, but yeah. had $8 billion in it. Yeah. But it turns out that like this poor spreadsheet discipline <laughs> was an institutional problem from before he was like panicking yeah. like a kid sort of submitting his assignment at 11.58 p.m. the night before. Mm. Here is a, a quote from the Ringer reporting on the SPF trial talking specifically about the spreadsheets mm. issue and how spreadsheets are circulated. There are spreadsheets with line eyeballs labeled, oops, this seems like not a thing we should be counting. 
like one that Caroline Ellison, the former CEO of Bankman Freed's trading firm, Alameda Research, said she prepared. There are spreadsheets where the accounting is rounded not to the nearest decimal, but to the nearest billion. <laughs> there are spreadsheets where the accounting is labeled with euphemisms like exchange borrows that mean illicitly wormholed FTX customer <laughs> funds. There are spreadsheets showing Alameda's $65 billion line of credit on FTX's systems, an allowance that was $64 billion, $850 million more than that of the next highest customer. <laughs> so many spreadsheets, all crowded with tabs, each one lousy with alarming valuations and bad news. Mm. So the thing that came out in the story that Carolyn talked about a lot as well is that FTX basically, before things went to, went to crap, was getting its investors and uh, depositors some of its larger ones, essentially asking, hey, can we start, can we see some information about what's going on here? Mm. She presented uh, SBF with like a document that essentially had the state of play as it was. Mm. And this was when FTX was still technically in the black, like it was, you know, its assets were higher than its liabilities, which is kind of where you want to be as a business generally. But it still looked really bad because the way that they had gotten to that situation was not totally legitimate mm. and was pretty unstable. And um, SPF basically went back to Carolyn and was like, can you give me like a different, can you s- redo this spreadsheet so it like looks better? <laughs> Which is when someone asks you that yeah, uh, is normally when you're a bit, that's normally when you leave. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and anyway, so she pre- presented him with like eight alternative spreadsheets mm. with various things taken out and put back in to essentially sell and lie to these people who are asking for information mm. to make it look better. And they eventually settled on one, which was like a completely fabricated version of what their books look like. Yeah. Yeah. I think it removed most of the Alameda liabilities. Yeah. Which is just like, let's just let's just not include. The, the biggest black mark on our entire organization. Yeah. The other tidbit was, so SBF, Sam, was um, known for wearing a T-shirt and like sandals, shorts, and uh, his messy hair. And this it turned out it was highly orchestrated to a certain extent. Yeah. Where he, he saw the value of it. He saw it as part of his brand. Yep. And the, keep in mind that he, is, he looked well-groomed for this, his latest hearings. Mm. Like he had he cut his hair, he was wearing a suit, et cetera. So obviously the unkempt look wasn't uh, what they were going for in like a New York court of law. Mm. But yeah, like again, the, some reporting said uh, that Ellison described – his, he, he said he thought his hair had been very valuable, unquote, saying that he thought that he'd gotten higher bonuses while interning at Jane Street because of his messy hair, which is obviously insane. <laughs> Let me just put it out there. I think that he is actually an unkempt, slovenly guy. Yeah. I don't think it was too put on. Yeah. But it is funny that he, like, it was playing into this image that like, hey, he's just like this geek. Yeah, I, I agree that it's probably not fully constructed, but it's more like a justification for the laziness, perhaps. Like, yeah. as in, I refuse to brush my hair and like put on a t shirt and put on pants. And, and you know, this type of guy, right? Who's like, no, actually, the reason I don't do it is genius, it's because it's part of my brand and it gives across this, like, yeah. and create some like epic justification for actually why it's really smart when at the end of the day, yeah, you're right. He's probably just a bit lazy and, you know, you, you can justify it though. And it did work. Don't be wrong. It worked. Like people oh, fell yeah. for it. There like, was a lot of like that dominated sort of like profile coverage of him. Yeah. Like look at this guy. Yeah. You know, yeah, uh, Mark Zuckerberg always wore a grey T-shirt or whatever. Mm. But this guy is a fucking slob. He's disgusting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And look, he's, he's not even trying. Davo- Davos with, yeah, you know. He's sitting next to Bill Clinton. On. Yeah. yeah. But he's actually a genius. Yeah. Yeah. You speak to him for a minute and you just realize, wow, this guy could be the next president. Absolute genius. Anyway, so then um, the other kind of two big hitters to take the stand were CTO and CFO, really. Nishad Singh. Yeah. This is the money man controlling finances. So he came across on the stand as he certainly portrayed himself as a victim and should say both Caroline... Nisha, anyone who testified has entered into plea deals. Yes, to, no, they've they've turned state witness. Yes, yeah. they flipped. They flipped on their boy. That's crazy. You hate to see it. You hate to see it, folks. You know? <laughs> what happened to what happened to loyalty? Yeah. What happened to values? Damn. Firstly, he accused SBF of humiliating him because so he basically has presented himself when he's like, "Hey, um, you know, we're spending a fair bit of cash." Don't know if we should be spending this much. Like, what's going on? SBF said he was sowing seeds of doubt 
in the company decisions. And people like him were the real insidious problem here, is uh, the claim, which, you know, sure, maybe. <laughs> but um, one of the funny kind of moments that came out of the trial was like um, when he approached Caroline Ellison when he was like, hey, we FTX, like we might need to recall some of like this Alameda debt that you have with us. Like you've got several billions of dollars of debt with FTX. Like, can we recall it? The uh, the attorney said, so how did Carolyn Ellison respond to your message? Nishad Singh says, she said, that's impossible. I said, which part of it? I was pretty alarmed and I was hoping it wasn't the part about closing out accounts. As in, I was hoping it wasn't the part that would be impossible uh, where they say that they want to pay us back closing out their accounts. What did she say? That it was the part about closing out accounts. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, she basically said like, yeah, all that money, those billions of dollars we owe FTX, which you've been kind of hiding from the books. Yeah, we can't pay it back. Then he like approached SBF and was like, you know, we need to have a conversation about this because there's a huge hole in our books because of Alameda. And um, SBF said, I'm not sure what there is to worry about. And when he was like, well, we're short billions and billions of dollars because of Alameda, SBF said, right, that we are a little short on deliverable. There was also the the takeaway from this that in the early days when Alameda was starting to like leak all this money to or, or take all this FTX money loans to invest, uh, they kept hitting like their limit, which was in the, the, yeah, bi- yeah. the billions of dollars, obviously. And they kept happening repeatedly. Like they would hit the $2 billion limit, $3 billion limit, $4 billion mm. limit. And SBF asked this guy to jack up the limit as high as he possibly can so to a limit they probably weren't going to hit. Mm. Uh, and they eventually settled on the figure of $65 billion. Yeah. Having a having essentially an open slather account, yeah. which you can invest in whatever, with a limit of $65 billion. Yeah. Uh, doesn't strike me as a well-run organization no. or a legitimate one. But Yeah, it's one of those things where like when you've already extended the leash out to them at $1 billion and they hit that and request it to be kind of grown, you might have the conversation about like, okay, what kind of leash are we going to give these guys? 10% here maybe. You know, they're a big customer. They're our biggest customer in some yep. ways. 20% to get from one up to $65 billion. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I should say, on the fraud side of things, like Sam Bankman-Fried asked him and a bunch of, this is Nishad, and a bunch of other people who work there to send FTX all of their Solana tokens and backdate them so that they could prove to the CFTC that um, their books were legitimate. As in, like, this is pretty open and shut fraud here. No, totally. It's, <laughs> it's like, I, like, like think, real real fraud going on. Yeah, the thing that the thing that... I think really comes across in this whole thing is that not only was, was this like absolutely demented fraud at all levels and there's just like absolute complete web of lies escalating problems at no point in any of this was sophisticated right yeah, yeah. and like the pro- the prosecutor came out at the the top of their opening statement essentially and said yes crypto is very very new crypto is sh- shiny and complex very hard to wrap your head around but what's happened here is basically the oldest crime that exists yeah, yeah, yeah. and like it's the stupidest crime that exists yeah. and the way that it was done was incredibly unsophisticated it was taking money that you weren't supposed to have yeah or you and then spending it profligately yeah on and these then, stupid things and then when the authorities say like hey, we want to check your books, you then transfer in a bunch of things and like get some white out and change the date at which they were transferred and say, here you go. Literally. Yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> you know, the, cl- the, the classic thing that people do when they um, when you have to submit an online assignment at a certain time and you just open up the file, like the document in text editor and yeah. just like change stuff randomly so it corrupts. Yeah. <laughs> and you submit it and go, oh, fuck, sorry. So you get an extra day. That's literally what they were doing yeah. at the scale of tens of billions of dollars. The other thing about Nishad, though, he was seen as, because, you know, like there are certain <laughs> campaign like finance violations yep. and whatever was obviously another kind of vague part of this. But he was seen as like, you're the person who has to donate to woke causes, which he said he felt a little bit uncomfortable <laughs> about. He was the center left face of our spending. Giving to a lot of woke shit for transactional <laughs> purposes was the direct quote. <laughs> Hell yeah. Yeah. And so the... To, highlight it the campaign vi- finance violations are also something that SBF has been charged with but it wasn't part of this trial no. it's there's trial those charges are still live and it kind of depends on what 
his uh, sentence is going to be as to whether they pursue that because yeah. he could get sentenced to jail for 200 years or whatever, yeah. uh, which is a lot of possibility. But I think the funniest thing about all this stuff has been kind of like the ongoing reaction to it, right? Mm. Both sort of like in general. I mean, I think a lot of people have kind of moved on. Like the, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. obviously not the biggest story that it was when it first happened. The tech industry has certainly moved on. Mm. The funny reason is it's not necessarily because – there's no, they're not implicated in any way, but it's the fact that like people just moved on from crypto and Web3. Well, yeah, and also a lot of the loudest voices don't want to talk about the fact that they were so loudly pro-crypto, right? Like it's embarrassing. It's incredibly embarrassing. And so like, A, have invested in FTX, B, say that crypto is the future of this, that, and the other, blah, blah, blah. Totally. Blah. It's only the real psychos and sickos who are still kind of touting that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I bought a, um, side note, 3070 Ti from- Oh, uh, yeah. Travis card for like 260 bucks off a guy in an Ethereum t-shirt. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> like that's a good deal. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah. How was he looking uh, chastened? No, he well, he said, oh, do you want to test it? It was actually lovely, I have to say. Uh, and I was like, no, nah, mate, I know where you live. Uh, haha. And um, <laughs> and he was like, well, if it doesn't work, I've got plenty of them. So you can just swap it for another one. Yeah, I'm sure you do, brother. <laughs> well, I mean, so yeah, the, I mean, the tech industry reaction has always been kind of like interesting and complicated. Because, and we mentioned this in our FTX episode, he always had like mixed reputation within the industry. Mm. A lot of crypto people hated him yeah, because yeah. he was trying to bring it, make it legit, quote unquote. Well, and the woke stuff. Yeah. And also, he was donating to democratic politicians. There was like the yeah the image that he was he was turning crypto, which is based, yeah, crypto very based, into something that was uh, woke and cringe. Yeah. Exactly. But well, he was trying to mainstream it, yeah, yeah. For it was the people who were like, oh, this will be the end of the financial system, blah, blah, blah. You had this other guy saying, actually, we want to put futures c- contracts on the blockchain and we want to integrate with the financial system. Yeah, they, they, they didn't like that. But Not enough ma- freedom. The mainstream kind of like VC universe, investor universe, back when crypto was sort of the hot thing of the moment, which it certainly isn't anymore, in terms of people who have taken an enormous L or organizations who have taken an enormous L, mm. Sequoia Capital, yeah more than any other investor or whatever or partner has taken that heat. They were a big investor in, in FTX. Not long before all this stuff went down, they published this long feature article on their website about how Sam Bankman fried is a genius. Yeah. That was essentially the thrust of like a seven or 8,000 word article. Yeah, yeah. They've been pretty quiet over the last little while. This was highly embarrassing. Like they were supposed to be known for, they're the VC that does Strict due diligence, and they're, they're like they've been around since the 1970s. Yeah. They're one of the most entrenched venture capital funds in Silicon mm. Valley. They have systems and processes. Uh, yeah, yeah. So Alfred Lin, who's a partner at Sequoia, did like a thread a few days ago after the guilty verdict. Uh, he said, "Today's swift and unanimous verdict confirms what we already knew: that SBF misled and deceived so many, from customers, employers to business partners." and uh, investors, including myself and Sequoia. Mm. Immediately after FTX collapse, we extensively reviewed our due diligence process and evaluated our 18-month working relationship with SPF. It said like the nice little minimization, we're only working for 18 months. Yeah. We concluded that we had been deliberately misled and lied to. Mm. In the last year, we've had to remain quiet while the prosecution built its case. And through the trial period, we are pleased that the trial is over. Obviously, this is like the saving face for what was a tremendous fuck up because as we've just described yeah. this is a company that did not have a risk team mm. just like didn't have one yeah yeah this is for, this is a company that's like a financial services firm functionally that's dealing with billions and billions and billions of yeah, dollars yeah. they have what like 50, no oversight. 60 billion dollars of assets under management and like this is huge yeah again going back to John Ray who is the uh that ex Enron administrator is coming to administrate this he said he's never seen anything like it this is just one big sl- sloshing pile of money yeah. with no delineation between mm. things. They were using QuickBooks, which again, <laughs> good software for small business. I actually recommend it over Zero. Sorry, unless Zero wants to sponsor, in which case I'll well, we'll quickly have, change my tune. But um, great for small businesses, QuickBooks. But it was obviously like vaguely QuickBooks with some spreadsheets to just manage like billions <laughs> and billions and billions of dollars. Totally. Just Crazy. Like, yep. it really is, like, loco areas. That, I'm just imagining someone putting $10 billion into, like, a raise account or, like, one of those, like, savings. Yeah. The ones that, like, that round up your transactions to, yeah, put, yeah, to, yeah, to, yeah. to put... Imagine just putting $10 billion into one of those. <laughs> <laughs> Inve- investing in, like, small cap Australian stocks yeah, or yeah. whatever. 
But it is funny that yeah, in the spreadsheets as well, they just like rounded off things to like the nearest hundred million or billion dollars, and just like yeah, that's how we account. <laughs> That's how we do accounting. No worries. Yeah. So it's for basically this complete cowboy operation, yeah. it is like fairly humiliating for someone like Sequoia, who a lot of reporting came out that they felt like they missed the early crypto boat. Yeah, yeah. And they were on the back foot. And a lot of, especially old school funds in Silicon Valley, found themselves in that position. Web3 crypto suddenly exploded. Yeah, they was, looked around. They saw these other funds making squillions of dollars, 100xing, you know, within 12 months. On, yeah, exactly. Like, weird tokens fl- fl- and shit. Yeah, exactly. Flipping tokens and shit. And then, like, you know, the vibe in the air that was sort of, like, percolating was, like, this is not just a category of software that we're investing in. Mm-hmm. This is literally how stuff is going to get funded in the future. Yeah, yeah. Like, people are going to raise money for companies via, like, doing a token offering. They're yeah. going to like, so we're, we're not just missing the boat on a cool company. We're missing the boat on like a whole new fucking paradigm yeah. that we're never going to be able to catch up. FTX apparently, they were so hot and the, and the segment and the category was so hot that they were able to, if anyone basically for a, a second asked about seeing any books or due diligence, SPF just wouldn't respond. They just wouldn't respond and they because they'd find the cash somewhere else. So everyone got like, oh, fuck. Like, why are we asking? For you? We, we have to get in on this business. We have to invest. Like, this is the hottest business. We have an opportunity to invest. Why haven't we invested yet? You know, is the, the word from yeah. on high. And it's like, well, then fuck the due diligence. We have to get in. Yeah. B- because he was able to basically give you the cold shoulder if you'd ask any questions. Yeah, yeah. So when like they, Sequoia and, and whoever else come out and say, we were misled. Say, like, well, yeah, you were, but also it's, so humiliating that you let that happen yeah. and you, you weren't able to like see right through it. And there's been examples of like, um, I can't remember who it was, but there was a, some of, there was leaked emails that came out through the the course of the, the trial. Mm. And one of them was basically, I wish I knew I could remember which VC it was, but it was like somebody at a fund uh, who basically asked in response a whole list of like every single question mm. that basically the prosecutors were asking in yeah. this and saw straight through it. And it's just one of those things, like, all of these com- these funds and companies just had blinkers on and couldn't yeah. see past the boy genius stuff and the FOMO, yeah. which is what fucking crypto was about. That's, like, the animating energy of yeah. the crypto industry From bottom FOMO. to top, from, like, yeah. someone that you see on X or whatever responding to SBF saying, please, sir, I, I invested, you know, 50 US dollars. It's everything I had. Will I see it back? Even if I get 40, can I please have it back? To... Yeah, the biggest VCs in the world. They all just FOMO'd in. They FOMO'd in. That was that that was the whole that was the whole industry. Which I guess leads us to the thing of something that we haven't done an episode on in a while, apart from a couple of Q and A questions or whatever. But like crypto generally, I think it's fair to say took an almighty like smacking from this. Yeah. Obviously the crypto winter in generally, like the downturn in prices, which have not rebounded. Although there was a, a couple of weeks ago, there was like a big Bitcoin surge, yeah, which hit like the news for a while. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I assume was like coin holders like selling off or whatever. Yeah. But aside from the, the general crash in prices, this was like the biggest reputational smack you could ever receive. Yeah. Because if it wasn't already associated with like, you know, it used to be 50% fraud and 50% betting on the Greyhounds. Maybe I'll make some yeah. some coin off this. In the average person's mind, completely associated with criminal fraud. Essentially. Yeah, this is the thing. Like people ask me as well, like, "Oh, well, should I buy some now for the next pump?" Because, like, yeah, this happened last time, and it happened the time before, and then it always yep. comes back. But there's a certain point where you max out the people willing to lose money again. Like the scale of this bust was so big because there was so much money in it. So many people lost money that, like, I mean, the whole thing about like making Bitcoin number go up is that you need demand. Like you need yep. other people to be investing fresh money in it. And so many people lost money. So many people who were dipping their toes in the water are never going to return to it. So many institutions who got conned from like Canadian pension funds yep. to like banks or whatever to investors like Sequoia who got made to look like absolute fools because the naysayers like us, by the way, on record the whole time, <laughs> check the receipts. We got the receipts. Guess what? We get to take a victory lap and say, like, we were right and you look like fucking idiots because everything we said was true. All those people who were burnt aren't coming back in. So you got to find new suckers. And how many new suckers are there? Yeah, totally. So I don't know. Like, will it come back again? Maybe. I mean, it does show some resilience to kind of yeah, coming yeah. back at the next pump. But just so many people burnt that it feels 
tough for me to see like another full on bull run like we had just because yeah, like, yeah. Who, who's left? The bull case for this stuff generally. And it wasn't just this, it was also the rise of like AI as the next, you know, the next thing, mm. uh, the current thing or whatever that tech industry is talking about. So like as a result, the last time I heard the word Web3, aside from when I just said it, mm. was probably a month ago, just yeah. like even reading it online. It's just crazy how you couldn't <laughs> take a step outside without hearing it somewhere. Yeah, like so literally footy podcasts that I'd listen to, one of the guys would always be talking about his friggin' coins and investments. Yeah, I'm yeah. like a footy podcast. Yeah, yeah, like and you totally the NFT stuff, like that bizarre culture that exploded for, you know, nine to twelve months, where whether it be bored apes or whatever. <laughs> and aside on the um the bored ape stuff, I just thought I'd give you all an update on that. There was a a bored ape event, ape fest in uh, Hong Kong. And apparently the the lamps they had on stage were pumping out real intense UV light. So there's all these guys with Bored Ape avatars on Twitter posting, 3 a.m., woke up, eyes burning. I could barely open them. Getting a few pings on eye issues from ape, ape friends that were up close with us front stage at ApeFest HK. I woke up at 4 a.m. and I couldn't see anymore. Had so much pain and my whole skin is burned. Needed to go to hospital. The doctor told me the U of E, the lighting was the stage that did it. It's the same effect as sunlight. Still can't see normally. So that, I mean, that, that that's kind of like the, that's the end of, that's where the NFT has ended up. So a whole you, bunch of guys in Hong Kong getting you, incinerated by us on stage sun. <laughs> so there's, you spend $50,000 to get a token to an exclusive club that just pumps uv rays in your <laughs> eyes and face and hospitalizes and you and hospitalizes you with blindness <laughs> and even before you went blind you had to hang around with a bunch of other board ape holders i think like the bull case on this stuff is that you know and this is they say it, they've said it every single crash where it's like all right all right now the speculation has been evacuated from the system let's build baby mm. let's make stuff and it's like I believe when I see it. The moment yeah. I see, if I see something that's useful and isn't just like a vehicle for more speculation, yeah, I'll hear you out. Because as I've said before, the broad mission statement of like let's trustless, trustless, let's get the power away from like the four websites that run everything now. Yeah, yeah, sounds great. Yeah, but yeah. give Love me the idea. I send ten bucks directly to you, James. Like no intermediaries other than like the miners and the weirdness that goes on there. But yeah, love it as a concept. Sure, Great. show me the money. Show, but not too much money. Yeah, don't show me crazy amounts of money. Just show me a normal amount of return. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, build something. World coin. Oh, oh yeah, doing that. No, yeah, we'll be yeah. Doing that. World coin. Scan my eye or whatever. Scan, scan my fucking eyeball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that sounds good. Make my life better. <laughs>If you're listening to this, did you know there's another world out there where you get a second episode of Down Round a week? Yep, it's called Down Round Premium. That's right, and there's no interruptions. No interruptions, no ads, two episodes a week, including the free one you're getting right now, plus another one. Yep, seven bucks a month, not a week, a month, downround.net, downround.net, instant access to the whole back catalogue as well. You've got so much to catch up on. There's so much. Get around it. Mmm. <laughs>